that uh, okay uh, thank you for that Stephen um so I'm currently based uh, in, in Tokyo um, uh, postdoc uh, through the, the JSPS which was um, delayed by about 18 months due to COVID. Um, so yesterday I'm talking about sound symbolism. Uh, so in Western Austronesian languages, a, a preliminary typology or perhaps even a tentative typology, um, as there's not been a lot of research done on the Austronesian languages in, in uh, sound symbolism. Uh, this is something I hadn't actually looked at before in three of the languages which um, I've done research on over the last 10 years or so, um, but relatively recently I've become, um, I've joined a, a collaborative research effort through the University of Šafarik in Slovakia, which is looking at onomatopoeia, so that's where my interest started to, to grow in the, in the topic. And today... One moment. Um, so this was just a... Sorry, slight lag here. This was just a bit of background introduction on myself, um, which Stephen's already done. Primary research focus is in documentary and descriptive linguistics um, in three languages in the northern tip of the island of Sulawesi in the Minahasan microgroup, and also a little bit of work on one of the vehicular or trade Malay Creoles, Manado Malay, which is the language of wider communication. Uh, in terms of what I'm trying to do today, um, so increase knowledge of, of sound symbolism um, in Western Austronesian languages by looking at the morphological, phonological, semantic features of this in seven Austronesian languages. Look at some of the similarities and differences uh, in the features between the languages, try to identify some typological features of Western Austronesian sound symbolism, and then compare these features to um, a number, I think it's three or four cross-linguistic uh, traits which have been described as universal for, for sound symbolism. Just how I'll present this. So first I'll just give a bit of a definition and some relevant previous research of sound symbolism. Introduction background to the languages and the data I'm using. Then look at the phoneme, syllable structure, morphology, word classes, um, semantic domains, which we find for sound symbolism in the languages. Then try and tie it all up, talk about a couple of the issues and where research um, can probably head from, from here. So to begin, um, so the assumptions I'm using for sound symbolism, the, the definitions, um, the terms used as an umbrella term, which subsumes various related phenomena, um, but which have distinguishing features. So things like onomatopoeia, idiophones, memetics, iconicity, uh, assumed to be the underlying mechanism for, for things like onomatopoeia, um, but with the note that sound symbolism, unlike onomatopoeia, is not always uh, considered to be directly imitative. And obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, the sound symbolic approach is based on the notion of a more systematic, um, non arbitrary link between sound and meaning. Some very obvious English examples, things like bang, crash, woof, woof, thump, ding, uh, and the like. The, uh, so, in some of the more previous research, we get Subcategorization of sound symbolism into imitative, corporeal, conventional, and synesthetic. Um, so the first one often mimics sounds created by animals and animate objects, human voices, so things like cockadoo do and woof woof. Um, corporeal, um, voluntary, and you know, symptomatic sounds, emotional and physical states of being, things like maybe achu in English. Conventional, where you get an association of certain phonemes and clusters with certain semantic domains in, in sound symbolic lexicon. So things like phonus themes, like the GL for gleam, glitter, um, glint in English, and synesthetic where you get certain sub segments um, representing vision, touch, appropriate perception of objects. So things like high vowels for smaller things or high frequency things, and lower vowels for, for um, uh, augmentation or, or 
um, heavier, bigger things. In terms of previous research that's relevant, so obviously some of the earliest well-known one is the um, cola looking at uh, sound symbolism as an auditory stimulus evoking sensory experience. So the Kiki and Buba experiment where nonsense words were um, commonly attached to certain specific shapes by speakers. And this work has carried on. Um, we get some later research which claims there's a pivotal role of sound symbolic form and meaning in human language evolution. And also that we get sound symbolism in, in uh, non-human species as well. Can find arguments against this um, and against the idea of certain types of sound symbolism as completely non-arbitrary and against other aspects of, of um, sound symbolism phenomena, but they're reasonably rare. In terms of previous language specific and cross-linguistic research, um, for better documented languages, things like English, uh, especially Japanese, there's, there's quite a lot of um, quite a lot of, of uh, publications and literature. Um, far fewer cross-linguistic or typological, but cross-disciplinary studies for sound symbolism. There's some relatively recent exceptions, um, two of which I'm using part of them as a, a framework for the presentation today. So the 1995 and 2001 um, edited volumes. In terms of Austronesian languages, of which there are quite a few, almost 1300, many which are undocumented. So there's really not a lot of work done that I could find. Um, there is broad, a broad ranging study done by uh, Bob Blust, um, uh, included one which has only just recently come out, which looks at CVC sequences of Austronesian roots as having common symbolic and, and meaningful, as being symbolic and meaningful in various Austronesian languages. Um, so these are parts of roots which he calls submorphemes, and he compares them to again to, to phonus themes in, in English. Um, but in the Austronesian languages, in terms of language specific um, uh, literature, there's really not a lot. Um, the ones I've shown here for Kambera, Balni, Sedik, Tagalog, Ilocano, Bahasa Indonesia, and Numbami and Jabem are, are the main ones that, that I could locate. Um, quite a lot of Dictionaries and grammars seem to omit um, and not uh, document or try to document sound symbolism. Um, and I'm also completely guilty of that. Um, it wasn't something I looked into when I did my earlier research. So there's not a lot that's been done thus far. Um, so what I'm gonna try and do is look at seven geographically and, and relatively genetically diverse Western Austronesian languages. Um, by Western Austronesian, I essentially mean with one or two exceptions, the um, languages of, of um, Maritime Southeast Asia, um, uh, Madagascar, um, and nothing from the, the oceanic um, higher order group. So the languages I'm looking at, um, there are seven, so Sedik, Ilocano, Tundano and Tambulu, Tonsawang, Kambera, and Standard Indonesian, um, Sedik is uh, in the higher order branches of Austronesian. The rest of them are Malayo Polynesian and within that Western Malayo Polynesian or Central Eastern Malayo Polynesian, um, with the exception of standard Indonesian, Bahasa Indonesia, which is uh, Malay Chomic. To give you a better idea geographically, uh, here's a map. Um, so obviously, Sedih, um, indigenous to Taiwan, further, further north there. Ilocano is uh, spoken in Luzon, uh, Northern Ireland in the Philippines. The three T languages are clustered in Northern Sulawesi there. Um, I've used three from the same microgroup as I had, I had my own data on that. Uh, Canberra, further south in the uh, East Nusa Tenggara. And standard Bahasa Indonesia spoken um, throughout the Indonesian archipelago. And in terms of uh, the status of the languages in, in, in places they're spoken, so obviously Bahasa Indonesia is a, a national language. Ilocano is quite quite strong and a major language in the Philippines. Um, Canberra is, is, I think, reasonably strong as well. The three T languages uh, have really quite low linguistic vitality and minimal 
status uh, and state is, is, is uh, quite similar, I believe. So the, the seven languages, um, I, I tried to get ones which were, had some diversity in terms of typology or Austronesian typology. The first four are the, the most uh, similar. They're all quite um, agglutinative. There's some, uh, some diversity there though, and they're quite different in terms of morphological type and voice alternations and complexity of verbal morphology with Canberra and, and Bahasa Indonesian. So in terms of the data, um, I'm hoping maybe you've been able to get the handout as there's quite a lot of lexicon I'll sort of be throwing at you. Um, but where I got the data from, so the three T languages is my own primary linguistic data, also from two dictionaries and elicitation and discussion with native speakers. Indonesian from two dictionaries, one online, um, one particularly good onomatopoeia um, and sound symbolism uh, publication in Japanese and a discussion with a, a speaker I know. The Sebi, Canberra, and Urakano are all from previous work by other researchers. Uh, so to begin, um, I'll look at phonology, um, syllable structure, also what are considered universal features for sound symbolism in previous literature. Um, so in the Hinton, Nichols, and Ohala uh, publication, there are two features which, which they give as universal for sound symbolism. This is the use of unusual or non-preferred segments, super segmentals or syllables in, in sound symbolic lexicon, and also specific types of segments or specific segments are associated with certain semantic realms. So this is what I'll look at first in the, in the seven languages. Um, to begin, just very briefly to, to outline the phoneme inventories. Um, there's quite a lot of overlap, as you can see. Um, the vowels are very Austronesian-y, Austronesian tend to get four or five um, vowel systems, uh, cardinal vowels and a schwa. Consonants are generally between, I think, 18 and, 18 and 25, on average for Western Austronesian languages. Um, Sedich and Tombulu have more fricatives. Um, language like Canberra has prenasalization, which is not found in the other languages. Um, which is found more in the area where Canberra is spoken and in places like South Sulawesi and, and Borneo. But there's not a lot that's um, surprising for Austronesian languages there. Uh, in terms of syllable structure, reasonably straightforward for these languages, a lot of CV, CVC, um, not a lot of consonant clusters or uh, in, in onsets. Um, you can get that in, in the three T languages sometimes. Bahasa Indonesia can have quite complex syllables in loan words, but um, words with Malay provenance are, are generally the simpler CVC. Um, Canberra uh, closed syllables are not preferred. Um, you can get more, um, uh, sometimes you can get vowel sequences. And Ulokano, again, CVC, and the syllables tend to have mandatory onsets. So if we look at these in comparison to what we find in the sound symbolic words, do we see unusual or non-preferred segments or syllable structure? Um, out of the seven language, only three have this. So four of the languages use the, the same segments and syllable structure as any other lexical item. So the only ones that have marked uh, segments or syllable structure, Sedich, Canberra, and Indonesian, so in Sedich, you get um, word final bilabials. So in something like up, up for the sound of frogs or sup for blowing wind. And also you can get more commonly um, CVVC uh, syllables in sound symbolic lexicon. So like the sound of calves calling and the cat sound. Canberra, you can get short vowels uh, in sound symbolism and also closed syllables, so CVC syllables in derived um, sound symbolic words. Indonesia just tends to have non-CVC consonant uh, clusters in initial clusters um, in low words, but only three of the seven have that. 
in terms of association with certain segments with specific semantic realms, um, we see this with all the languages except for Canberra. Um, and there's a bit of um, common features here, as you can see with the examples on the, on the right. Commonly, we get things like um, velas as coda or onset um, to uh, express nasal sounds or buzzing, things like that. Um, so we get that in, in most of the languages. Um, also get the alveolar fricative for things like hissing and rustling and wind sounds, which is not surprising. In a couple of languages, we also get things like the high vowels for smaller items. Um, and in Basa Indonesia, things like uh, the word initial plosives for short, sharp, and, and loud sounds. If you look at morphology and word classes and the languages, what I was looking at was how morphologically complex a sound symbolic roots and words. What word classes um, do we find that they function as? What morphological elements and processes are uh, available to sound symbolic roots? Um, and specifically, what sort of reduplication processes are there, um, inherent or productive, as this is given as another supposedly universal trait? So basically, for the languages, all of them except for Canberra have to, to varying degrees roots which can occur in isolation or with additional morphology. Um, all the roots appear to be monomorphemic, um, but most of the languages have roots which comprise similar or identical CVC syllables, um, something which has been labeled as inherent or fossilized for duplication in the uh, Western Austronesian languages. Um, to give you some examples of this, as you can see, really quite common to have um, syllables which are identical or, or similar, but in words which are uh, currently mono, monomorphemic. So things like in Cedic, Las, Las, Buk, 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 um, Ilocano, Sat, Sat, Set, Set, Kar, Kar, Bat, Bat. Um, the three T languages have it as well. So Ke, Ke, Hu, Hu. Rie, rie, nga, nga. Um, and then ones that are not identical but similar, so susup for slurping, gongor in tonsawang, gengar, um, uh, and again in Indonesian, gonggong, tumtum, kukur. Um, the only one which I didn't see uh, this in was in Canberra. So not morphologically complex, but historically uh, possibly so. In terms of the word classes, um, that sound symbolic lexicon function as in the morphology they can host, common quite across the board for nouns and verbs, except for Canberra, which only seem to be functioning as verbs. Um, the language that had the most uh, or tested the most functions for sound symbolism was Sedich, where we had things like verbs, adverbs, uh, verb complements, so and quotative clauses, interjections, and what was uh, labeled as a, a mini clause. Uh, the rest have nouns and verbs, and Ilocano and Indonesian that can function as adjectives as well. In terms of the morphology uh, which these roots can host, um, in four of them, or sorry, five, they host same morphology as any other, uh, verbs or adjectives. Um, Ilocano and Canberra had um, specific affixes which were used only for um, deriving sound symbolic verbs. Um, and Ilocano also used that in addition to standard morphological elements. The moment. So these are just a couple of examples of the more um, uh, unique uh, functions which I, I found in CDIC. So in the first example, we've got a sound symbolic roots acting as a verb complement in a quotative construction. So cut, cut, the sound of someone's teeth making a, a shivering sound, um, functioning as a verb complement to the verb to say um, in that particular clause. And also in the, in the, in the uh, example below, so sound symbolic roots occurring independently 
um, co-referential with a separate verb denoting the sound or event. So you have gal gal, um, the sound symbolic roots, um, referencing the verb to bark rule. Um, and this is what Lee has described as a mini clause, um, so clause external, and none of the other languages uh, seem to have that. To give um, a bunch of examples um, of the morphology that sound symbolic roots can take. Um, so we know, I mean, in most of the languages as well, so you get this, um, you get this characteristic where the sound symbolic root uh, uninflected can reference the sound being made or perhaps use a nominal function or perhaps reference the entity which makes the sound or, or the event and the addition of verbal morphology then describes the action or state of making the sound. Um, I mean I won't go through all of these but you can see in in CEDIC so you have the roots on the on the left the verbal form on the right and you get things like the mm, infix uh, you get prefixes including some reduplication Similar sort of thing in Ilocano, um, the underlined uh, prefixes e and ug, uh, that's morphology which is only used for uh, for sound symbolic roots to derive verbs, um, but also Ilocano uses the common uh, things like the infix um, prefix pa, uh, suffix an. For the three T languages, we get a similar a similar thing, so they all use uh, things like uh, ma or mo, uh, mung, which are common prefixes, the um uh, infix as well, uh, and also things like uh, the suffix um, and in the, the last uh, Tom Salong example you get e, which is a, a past tense marker, so tam marking as well. And some of these languages you get things like um, on the left, so meong, uh, which describes the cat and the sound the cat makes, and koko, describing a chicken, referencing a chicken and the sound a chicken makes. Uh, but all of these uh, languages solely use the, the morphological items which any other lexical items use. In terms of uh, Bahasa Indonesia, you get the same thing. So the root form um, can then take common um, uh, prefixes such as men, me, ber, which, uh, which um, derive verbs or adjectives. So we can see all the sound symbolic roots can host some uh, morphology except Canberra. Um, in terms of morphophonological processes, do we see reduplication, which is um, apparently a universal strategy for sound symbolism? Um, do we have this and what strategies are used? So all of um, the languages except Canberra um, have uh, duplication on sound symbolic roots. Um, across the board, the ones that the languages that have this, it um, encodes some kind of imperfective aspect, iterative or habitual. Um, in four of the languages, so the three languages of uh, Minahasa and Indonesian, you get this CVC, CV, bisyllabic reduplication occurring on roots um, attached directly to the root and then other uh, morphology can occur to the left of that. So things like in Kondano, Masie Siesang, Ma'atu Utut and, and so on. Um, Ilocano and Sedik uh, had something a bit different. So as well as, uh, so Sedik has full root uh, reduplication in nonverbal functions such as we just saw also has CV uh, duplication, uh, monosyllabic duplication. Um, Ilocano again has a, a process which only occurs on sound symbolic roots, so it's the the second vowel of the root um, is duplicated. So, um, for example, in the first root on the right, so visit can become umsiit, so where it takes a uh, duplication of the I. Uh, the high vowel and as well as the infix um uh, and Ilocano can also have full root duplication as well. So this was very common um, except for Canberra, uh, very common in terms of form and, and function. If I, uh, I turn to semantic domains uh, of, of 
the sound symbolic um, lexicon. So I, I looked at, um, well, there were six given as frequently attested semantic and pragmatic categories for sound symbolism in the edited volume I looked at. So this was um, mimicry of environmental sounds, expression of states of being, emotional and physical, expression of social relationships, including things like vocatives and imperatives, uh, salient characteristics of, of objects or activities, things like movement, size, shape, um, grammatical uh, discourse indicators, um, and expression of evaluative and effective relationship between speaker and, and subject. So I applied these to, to the um, all the uh, routes in the data sheets, uh, as well as I used two additional tech categories taken from the, the Onomatopoeia project I'm part of. And these were two macro, macro categories of, of natural sounds and non-natural or artifact sounds or events. Um, further subcategorized the natural sounds into elements, those from elements, animals, and humans, and the artifacts from musical instruments, vehicles, and mechanical and electronic equipment. So I applied these two sets, semantic and pragmatic domains to the, uh, to the data. Uh, in terms of what I found, um, in terms of the six cross-linguistic categories, so all of the languages had one, two, and four, so mimicry states of being, and they, these were the most common. Um, and also the fourth one, so salient characteristics, things like size, etc. Only one uh, language, so Sedig, had uh, the other categories, so grammatical discourse indicators and expressions of relationships. So, um, in terms of the other two categories I used, so the natural versus artifacts, this was quite um, uniform as well, uh, except for Indonesian, which had about a 50%, 50-50 split. All of the other languages had a, a far greater number of roots referencing natural sounds or events as opposed to non-natural. Um, from Sedic, which had 90% to 10, the others were around 70, 70, 30, 75, 25. So that was really fairly uniform. Um, the uh, one moment. So, in terms of trying to kind of wrap this up, just wrap this up into some kind of uh, typology, we can see that for the phonology, um, less than half of the language have marked syllables, segments, or syllable structure in their sound symbolic roots, which um, we would have expected more if it considered universal. Although most do have segments associated with certain semantic realms. Um, there's some uniformity, but not, not total across the languages. Um, I didn't specifically uh, indicate it, but there were some which had the CVC sequences, which were previously identified as having sound and meaning associations for Austronesian languages. Um, so for instance, there are examples of things like puck for to hit something, Ning and Nung for, for buzzing and hums, things like Gak and Kak for, for some sort of frog and animal sounds, Tuk or Tok for, for hitting things, Kik for throaty sounds, uh, Sup for drinking or, or slurping sounds, and things like Ke and Ng for, for nose or, or mouth sounds. So some sort of uniformity, but not total. Now in terms of morphology, so we see monomorphic roots, all the languages allow um, morphology except for one. Uh, you had two languages which had morphological elements specific to sound symbolic roots. The rest had the standard um, morphological elements. Um, all languages except one have roots with inherent reduplication, and all languages except one have productive reduplication processes with sound symbolism when you have um, functioning as verbs. Uh, in terms of semantics and pragmatics, um, this was fairly uh, uniform. So all languages used imitation or mimicry, states of being, and some had characteristics of objects or events. Um, only one language, so only Sadiq has more than uh, attested more subcategories than this. 
translating to entities in the natural world much more common um, than those which reference non-natural. Uh, and in terms of the, the subcategories I identified earlier, all of them um, occurred in the, the sound symbolism in the, in the language with imitative and corporeal probably being the most common. And uh, just to sort of sum up how the Western Austronesian languages compare the previously identified cross-linguistic traits. Um, so there's a three that I looked at. So marked phonology and phonotactics, linking of phonology and semantic realms and productive reduplication. So only two of the languages, so only Sadiq and Indonesian um, had all three. Um, Four of them had two, with this being the phonology and uh, phonotactical linking of semantic realms and productive reduplication. Uh, and the one that had the fewest was Canberra, which only had one. Um, so across the board, not, not all showing the universal, supposed universal features. Um, to sort of conclude and, and wrap up what we can take from these um, results. So, I mean, in the seven languages, there are broad similarities, uh, but you know the features are not uniform. Those with the closest geographic and genetic links, broadly speaking, are the most similar, which is not surprising. So, morphologically and semantically, I think there's more of a strong consistency in the data and a good starting point for a, a typology of uh, Western Austronesian sound symbolism. Um, decent evidence that previously attested universal features in the in terms of phon phonology, phonotactics are not always present, which I think highlights the problem of, of hypothesizing language universals, which I understand why linguists do it, but I do think it gets used too much to just sort of say a language has a bunch of bunch of bunch of languages show this feature and therefore it's it's uh, universal. Um, we saw this lack of roots referencing non-natural sounds or events. Um, I mean, in terms of the, the languages of North Sulawesi, I, I know there's very low language use and vital vitality, um, which means that often for more modern concepts, which um, are encoding sound symbolism, the words are often loans from the languages of wider communication. Um, but this doesn't really work in some of the other languages like Ilocano, um, where you get a similar thing, but it's it's quite got quite strong linguistic vitality in use. So that one uh, I'm not entirely sure at this stage. Also, um, in terms of the data, I mean, some of the non-attested features simply may not have been described yet. Uh, it was difficult obtaining in some degree, a clear overview due to the data, um, a lack of available data, and many of the languages are endangered and, um, and under-documented. Um, and not all of the studies I looked at had precisely the same focus. Some were more broad on sound symbolism, uh, like what I've tried to do, and others were more specific to onomatopoeia, video phones, uh, things like that. I think the data can be skewed towards certain semantic and pragmatic categories. So in underdocumented languages, if you're trying to identify or elicit sound symbolic words, it's much easier to explain things like mimicry and states of being um, rather than some of the other uh, subcategories, which are a bit more abstract and more difficult for non-linguists or native speakers. Um, and I think I found that in my own the languages that I've um, researched. Um, so I'll finish here and just say, you know, it's likely that Sound symbolism will be present in many or even all of the, the Austronesian languages. It's just more data uh, and more descriptions needed to, to produce a, a robust uh, typology. Uh, and I will say thank you for listening.